medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk today about gun violence. This is a topic that is quite germane, as we have seen here in the news recently. This is a medical topic. I'm a medical doctor, and this is one of the reasons why we need to talk about this, even at the risk of sounding political, although this video will not be political. This video is going to look at evidence. It's going to look at the medical evidence. And I think actually people on both sides of the political spectrum in terms of gun control are going to be surprised by some of the evidence that we present here today. As a ICU physician, I see a number of patients that try to commit suicide every year. And suicide is one of those things that is involved in gun violence. So what we intend to do in this video is to look at the problem itself, the magnitude of the problem, look at the data. And then also look at the issue from both the perspective of what is going on in the mind of the perpetrator who is performing the gun violence, and also what can we do as healthcare providers and as first responders in terms of the victims of gun violence. As always, we're going to explain this as clearly as possible. This issue is very complicated, and as we know, while there is a problem with gun violence in this country, there are also those millions of citizens who use guns responsibly and use it on a daily basis safely and without issues. So it's important for us to understand the issues and also the data so we can have a logical discussion regarding this issue. And before we go on, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that if you want to support this channel, please subscribe and turn on notifications and also join us at medcram.com where we have over 60 different topics with over 60 hours of continuing medical education units. Topics like EKG, ventilator, acid base. Join us at medcram.com. So the first thing I wanted to look at is in the United States, the number of deaths in thousands for, for instance, cancer deaths. We see here cancer deaths is about 600,000 a year. Smoking deaths are just under 500,000. If we look at gun deaths, it's actually on par with car deaths, and it's around 40 to 50,000 a year. And that works out to be well over 100 a day. Now, if you look at gun deaths, I've put here in orange above this, the amount of gunshot injuries that result every year, and then the number of gun deaths. Let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. Here you can see, again, gun deaths up to blue, which is just over 40,000 deaths a year. Car deaths is just under 40,000 deaths a year. And then here, up to 117,000 incidents with guns every year. And you can see the proportion that lead to death. So obviously, this is an issue. I mean, we have many different types of infrastructure and agencies that are dedicated to reducing deaths due to automobiles and safety on highways and things of that nature. And obviously, this is what we're dealing with in terms of car deaths. We're dealing with a similar amount here in terms of gun deaths. So this is not a small issue. But what we ought to do is look more carefully at those gun deaths and find out what exactly caused those gun deaths. And if we look at that, we can see here that 54% of those gun deaths in the United States were actually suicide. And 43% were where someone was actually taking someone else's life, or murder in this case. That's important to know because the question would be is would these people have committed suicide if they did not have access to guns or would they have chosen something else to end their life? And I guess the same can be said for murder. So the question then is, is what share of all murders and suicides in the United States involves a gun? And as it turns out in terms of murders, 79% of all U.S. murders in 2020, which is the same year that we used to look at these statistics, involved a firearm of some sort. And that was actually the highest percentage since at least the CDC started looking at records in 1968. Now, in terms of suicide, it's actually lower. 53% of all suicides involved a gun, and that's a number that has remained generally the same over the last few years. Now, this is important to understand for later on. Notice how high the suicide rate here is and the number of people that are using guns to complete suicides. 
this will become important later. And also, just to think about this, is that there obviously is a huge mental health component to gun violence. I think that's something that is going to be obvious as we go through this presentation. So the question really is, is it getting worse? That's one of the questions that people are asking. And if you go to the strict numbers, which I have here on the left-hand side, you can see that in 2020, which is the last year that we have numbers for, it was 45,222 gun deaths. And that was an increase over the previous year in 2019 of 14%, or a 25% increase from 2015, or a 43% increase from 2010, just 10 years prior. And whether you break that down into gun murders or gun suicides, you can see that generally speaking, there is definitely a percentage increase. However, if you look at the rate, which takes in consideration the population, you can see that even since 1968, when we started taking numbers, there really has been a pretty consistent rate that is adjusted for population. However, if you look even in the last few years, there's been a steady increase in the murder rate with gun violence and also a steady increase in suicide rate. So overall, it is increasing in terms of the rate, but it hasn't reached historical peaks yet. So the question is, is gun violence getting worse? By absolute numbers, yes. But by the rate, it seems to be about the same as it's been with some evidence of recent increase. However, if we look just at children and adolescents in the United States, as was shown here in this paper that was just recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, well, we can see here clearly that motor vehicle accidents have dramatically been reduced in children and adolescents in the United States since the change of the millennium. We can see here that there are two things that have gone up very substantially in just the last couple of years, and that is firearm-related injury, which is now the number one cause of death in children and adolescents, topping off at about six per 100,000. And we're also seeing drug overdose and poisoning going up almost at the same rate in the same population at the same time. This is another important thing that we're going to bring up later in the talk. What I would say at this point is that these things might be related to each other, and they may be connected through mental illness once again. Again, if you look at gun deaths in the United States and compare it to other industrialized nations, there is a definite contrast. Whereas in the United States, it's 11.9 deaths per 100,000 population. In other countries, such as Canada, it's 1.9. In the United Kingdom, it's 0.2. In Japan, it's 0.0. .0. On the other hand, if you look at the Americas, you see a different picture. So once again, we see here these very low gun death rates per 100,000 in Western Europe and Canada. But if we look at some South American nations, such as Honduras, Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela, and El Salvador, which actually do have some gun control measures, we see that there are even more gun deaths per 100,000. And we'll put a link in the description below that talk about the gun control policies in those South American countries where they are trying to register the guns, but it seems as though there's a lot of guns that are just not in the registry. And the authors of that paper also point out that there's a lot less trust in the government in those countries in South America. When we look at the United States, we also notice that there is a significant difference in the state firearm mortality rates, as you can see here, with the highest rates being in dark red and the lowest rates being a very light yellow. The highest rate specifically actually is in Alaska, and one of the lowest rates is in Hawaii. And of course, one of the types of events that always gets our attention because it's on the news is these active shooter incidents. And being a physician here in Southern California, I am keenly aware of something that happened very close to home, which is the 2015 San Bernardino incident where we had an active shooter. And so that's something that will stay in my mind for the rest of my life. I actually knew and met someone who was a survivor of that event, and they were shot, but they survived. And if we look and see here what's happened since 2000, each one of these boxes represents an active shooter incident that has happened in that year. 
And we can see here very clearly that over the last 20 years, there's been a steady increase in the number of active shooters. The definition by the FBI was that an active shooter incidence is defined as one or more individuals actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. And of course, this has caused officials to look at assault rifles because these are the types of weapons that are used most commonly in these type of active shooter incidents, which gets on television often. However, if we look at the types of guns that are actually used in murders and manslaughters, and we'll put a link to this data in the description below, you can see here that the simple handgun is the most commonly used weapon in terms of the number of murders. And when we look at assault rifles or assault weapons, it only makes up about 3% of the total number of people that are murdered. Shotguns make up an additional 1%, and what's unfortunate in this data is that there's about 36%, which we don't have data on, so we're not exactly sure. It would be helpful to know what that is. So now that we've gone over the statistics, and that's important to understand because that can sometimes be helpful in getting to the root cause of what's going on, the next thing I want to do is talk about the people who perpetrate these crimes. And those are the active shooters themselves, the people that have actually carried out these things. And in most of these cases, these people don't live. But there is some research that has gone into figuring out why these people do the things that they do. And there's actually something called The Violence Project and a book that was written called The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic, which I think was really interesting. The data that came out of their research, this was Dr. Peterson and Dr. Densley, who are in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Peterson is an associate professor in criminology at Hamlin University, and Dr. Densley is a professor of criminal justice at Metro State University. Their study was funded by the DOJ, and what they did was they looked at mass shooters since 1966, and a definition is anyone who shot and killed more than four people. And then they looked at every shooting incident in a school, workplace, or a place of worship since 1999, and that was about 180 different shooters that they were able to interview their family members, their friends, their colleagues, people that they left behind because in most of these cases, they didn't survive. There were, though, about five people that were in prison that had survived that they were able to interview. And they've come up with an interesting database about what is it about these people that caused them to do the things that they do. So if we look at this, the common threads that they found in terms of these shooters was that there was some sort of early childhood trauma it was either physical, sexual, bullying, parental suicides, some sort of early childhood trauma that they did not adjust to correctly. Now, there's many people that have early childhood trauma that don't do these things. So there was other things that were involved. But what they found was that when they didn't deal well or they didn't adjust to these things well, and what came in was hopelessness, despair, isolation, self-loathing, and even rejection— what happened is this led them to basically feel like they wanted to commit suicide. In a lot of these situations, people who commit suicide, they don't go out and hurt other people, they just kill themselves. And that's what we saw in this data that we saw at the very beginning, is that over 50% of the gun violence in this country is related to suicides. What they're starting to see here, though, is something a little different, and it may be related to what's going on in our society, is that instead of turning the hatred in on themselves, they're starting to direct that hatred to groups of people that are identified in our culture. So either it's racial, gender, religious, could even be classmates. And so what they're saying is that these would have been suicides, but because of the way that they've dealt with things, they turn these suicides into homicides and suicides, which is really interesting because even though they're showing up in body armor, they know that when they go into these kind of shootings, there's going to be somebody there that's going to take them out. In other words, they are planning their suicide, but they're doing it in a way that's going to take out other people along the way. Anyway, this is the theory of these researchers that did extensive research on these 180 shooters. So again, as we can see with these active shooter incidents, things really took off after about 2009, 2010, and started to take off as it was relatively stable at that point. 
and what can be seen here in this article that was published in March of 2020 titled Increases in Depression, Self-Harm, and Suicide Among U.S. Adolescents After 2012 and links to technology use, possible mechanisms. And what you can see here is that right around the year 2011 to 2012, there was a precipitous increase in not only suicide, but self-poisoning, major depressive episodes, and depressive symptoms. And of course, you could say that this is a correlation and that anything can be correlated to one another, but it doesn't necessarily meet causation. And that is absolutely true. Causation is not demonstrated necessarily by just correlation, but dose response curves can be very indicative of causation. And this is from the Psychiatric Quarterly that was published in 2019. What we have here on the x axis is dose response. The more time at doing something, and then here we have a percent low well being. So, for instance, if we look at the number of hours that somebody is online in the United States, we can see here that there's an increase in unhappiness. So the more hours that you're online, that is associated with an increase in unhappiness. Here we look at use of smartphones in the UK, and we can see here is that after about half an hour to an hour to two hours, there's an increase in terms of use per day of low well-being. That's also the same situation in the UK in terms of social media and depression. Any type of social media use in terms of hours of use increases the percent low well-being. If we look again here in terms of depressive symptoms in girls, for instance, we can look here at the Z-scores, which looks at standard deviations. And we can see here that things were going very well until we reached around 2009, 2010. And that's when depressive symptoms started to skyrocket in that population. It's also when we can look and show the number of internet hours that are being used and also social media use when it was introduced in around 2008, 2009. There seems to be a very specific correlation there, perhaps causation as well. We know that in around 2007, the iPhone was released at that time. It didn't have a lot of social media apps on it. But we can see here in terms of not hanging out with friends, typically 12th graders will hang out with friends more often. They will go out with their best buddies, teenagers, without their parents. That's obviously going to be higher in 12th graders, which is what we saw, and lower in 8th to 10th graders. As we all know, as you get older, you tend to hang out more with your friends without your parents. But notice what happened to that activity after about 2007 or so. Steep, precipitous drop. And so the question is, you're not hanging out with your friends, you're not socializing, you're taking your time looking at social media. This seems to have correlated with that type of activity. Also, more likely to feel more lonely, depressed, again, seem to go up precipitously after the iPhone in 2007 was released. Not saying that the iPhone is the cause of this, but it's just symbolic of the entire social media industry and depressive symptoms. And as we talked about before in our lecture on light as medicine, vitamin D isn't enough. We talked extensively about sunlight, getting outside, getting out of buildings and into the fresh air and sunshine and how important that is to reduce depression. Light's effect on the perihabenular nucleus is very important in preventing depression, but also staying up late, working on the iPhone, working on computers that light is going to reduce melatonin production, and it's also going to reduce total sleep time and delay your circadian rhythm. So the effect of not just the content, but the fact that you're looking at a device at night can be actually pretty disturbing to your health and also your mental health. And so you can see if we want to reduce gun violence, then there are a number of factors that we need to hit if we want to do it in an appropriate way. We're going to stop talking about the perpetrator of the gun violence, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the victims and what we're doing in these situations, what I think we can do better. And again, these types of situations are chaotic, and that's what we have to expect. There is no active shooter situation or large mass casualty environment that's going to be orderly. So we have to be prepared for that. And actually, there was a paper that was published back in 2013 that was actually published within the surgical literature 
titled Initial Management of Mass Casualty Incidents Due to Firearms, colon, Improving Survival. And this was written by Dr. Lenworth Jacobs. And what he talks about in this article is ways of being more aggressive at getting survivors out of these environments so that you can save their lives. As the clock is ticking, there is the increased risk of mortality. He says here that knowledge of the type of weapon and ammunition used in the shooting will help EMS to anticipate the nature and extent of injuries and to begin formulating a response. As with much trauma, injury due to firearms is related to kinetic energy or the force that is produced and strikes the victim. In addition, these characteristics of the frontal surface area of a bullet determine capacity to cause damage or cavitation. The profile, tumble, and fragmentation. And I remember learning this in medical school. We had a whole unit on forensic pathology where we would discuss the kinetics and the physics of bullets and how they would penetrate the body and were designed basically to cause as much potential damage inside the body as possible, ripping and tearing apart tissues, causing edema, and all sorts of problems. And so this is why these things are designed the way they are. It's to cause the most amount of damage. And so as he talks about here, the profile is the bullet's ability to increase its size on impact. If it does that, it's going to cause a lot more damage. The tumble is the bullet's ability to change its angle once inside the body. Of course, if it changes angle and moves around, rebounds and does things of that nature, it's going to cause more damage. And then finally, the fragmentation, the bullet's capacity to break into pieces, because the more pieces there are, the more damage it can invoke on its victim. Victims shot with a single low energy bullet that does not change size on impact, does not tumble to increase its impact, and does not break into fragments are going to cause the least amount of damage, and therefore you're going to have victims that are more likely to survive. So if you can tell what type of ordinance is being used during the assault, you can make an assessment quickly about what your chances are of getting people out early and to get them to survive. The authors of this paper make the point that greater attention to the needs of the victims is important. They say here that the scene is a medical emergency. Law enforcement personnel must focus not only on the shooter, but also the patients. A safe environment for EMS to quickly assess patients and begin their treatment, resuscitation, and transportation for definitive care is critical. Documenting the event and gathering evidence can occur while patients are being treated. In other words, you don't have to clear the area, gather all your information, document all of the bullets before you start treating the patients. The patients need to be treated immediately. He says the first priority needs to be assessment and care of the victims. As noted in the pre-hospital trauma life support program, patients are the most important people at the scene of an emergency. They go on in the paper to actually advocate for a tactical emergency medical support team that not only goes in there and tries to stop the shooter, but also to treat patients at the same time. He says that these are specially trained and equipped to function within the perimeter of the danger zone. They support the special operations of law enforcement by injury control, care under fire, special extraction, and tactical rescue. This group supports the missions of law enforcement while maximizing victims' clinical outcomes and minimizing risk to caregivers. This is basically military medicine, which include tactical combat casualty care guidelines, and they are basically the standard for care for military tactical medicine. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians have endorsed these guidelines through this PHTLS program that we talked about before. All communities should have rapid access to tactical emergency medical support teams. They go on to say that, unfortunately, the time has come when intentional civilian mass casualty incidents require a military-like response. This approach will enhance rapid assessment, treatment, and triage of patients. Mass casualty shootings should be viewed as medical scenes where treating patients is a top priority. Now, I want to point out, this was not written this year in 2022. This was written back nine years ago. This was written at a time where there were other mass casualties that they were talking about, for instance, in Newtown. And they go on to state that although the concepts proposed here would not have saved the 26 Newtown victims, survivability of future mass casualty shootings will be enhanced if EMS and law enforcement personnel adopt policies and procedures for rapid patient assessment, treatment, and transportation to definitive care. So there's no question that there needs to be a discussion in this country about gun control. 
But there also needs to be a fervent understanding of where this is coming from. And what we're seeing here is while we're not seeing a dramatic rate in gun violence in this country, although it is increasing, what we are seeing is an increase in active shooter incidents, which based on the data that we've reviewed may be related more to suicide and suicide causes than homicide. And that's important to understand when we look at this New England Journal of Medicine article, which again shows clearly that firearm related injuries are going up at the same time that drug overdose and poisoning is going up. I think the important things to understand from this is not only the availability of assault rifles, but also the epidemic of depression and mental health issues in our adolescents and what may be causing that epidemic. I think both sides of the political spectrum need to be able to sit down and have a rational discussion about what we can do to prevent these things from happening again. Thanks for joining us. 